Hello, and welcome back to Lunch and Learn, the Leeds video podcast, where we take an in-depth look at the art scene here in Lincoln and the arts industry as a whole. We're kicking off February today with the New York City writing team, Selda Sahin and Derek Greger, to talk about their project, Modern, a new musical about a group of Amish teens on Rumspringa. The talented duo workshopped the musical at the Leeds Center during the 2019 ASCAP Grow a Show workshop, where they presented a staged reading of Modern to great accolade. Today on the pod, we'll sit down with Zelda and Derek to talk about how they got started working together, the process of taking a musical from idea to the page, and the surprising familiarity of their timeless coming-of-age story. I'm Ryan Savage, an education and outreach specialist here at The Lead, and joining me on the pod today is The Lead's Education and Community Engagement Director, Jane Shermar. Yes, I'm super excited to have you on. Um, and you know, I'm really excited as well to kick things off today with our guests all the way from New York. But before we start, I'd like to share a bit of the music with y'all from the show. This is one of my favorite songs for Modern and for all you rock fans out there, I think you'll like it too. This is Drive It Like You Stole It. Great. I and I actually intentionally did not watch what you sent me, Ryan, beforehand. Oh, really? Because <laughs> yes, because I wanted like a genuine reaction, and um, I really enjoyed um, just the drive of that song. It really gets yeah. you like it's hard it's not to like move your stuff. body to that, right? <laughs> yes, yes, it's definitely a bop, or I don't know what you, I guess I don't know. I'm not. I don't know it's the kind lingo, of a jam. Like, I feel like a jam, kind of a jam. jam. That's that's better. Yeah. Yes, I just call everything a bop because I'm not. Um, well versed in that lingo. Um, but yeah, for our audiences, I believe that th this is a moment and I, I don't know if there's like a word that where they refer to like non Um, but like in Harry Potter, they have like muggles and <laughs> wizards and everything. I don't know if there's a word, I can't recall. We can ask Salt and Derek, if there's a word for non-Amish individuals, but this is a uh, a moment shared between um, one of the Amish teens who's on Rumspringa and one of the individuals in the community who's not Amish, who he met. Um, and I believe, um, and what we can ask them when we, when we see them, that they're, that that's kind of the reason why there's a little bit of a different feel musically uh, for this song. But it was, it was so much fun watching one of my really good friends, Matthew Carter. Um, he performed this show during the stage reading and he killed it. It was, it's just definitely one of the songs that you 
walk away from the show taking with you. So I'm really glad that we do have the creative minds behind this song and all the other great music in modern to give us the background deets. That way, you know, we don't have to just chat about it ourselves. In ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, joining us today, like I said at the beginning, we have Selda Sahin and Derek Greger, the writing team behind modern, and we'll be chatting with them about how they got started working together, the process of taking a musical from idea to page, and the surprising familiarity of their timeless coming of age story and it looks like there we go we have them live hi guys hello hey guys happy to be here happy to have you with us um it's great to have you both on today like i said and it's wonderful to see you again uh modern was such an exciting project to be a part of and i'm just glad that we had the opportunity to bring you guys back um but for our viewers who didn't see modern when we performed it at the lead center can you give us a quick overview of the plot and what the show's all about you do. <laughs> Modern <laughs> is, it follows a group of Amish kids on their Rumspringa, um, which is this period of time that they are allowed, they, they're allowed to leave their faith and their community um, with sort of no rules. Um, and they have to choose to come back and be baptized into the church. Um, and that's when, and that's when uh, rules get extremely strict. Um, so we follow this, this group, uh, two of them fall in love one of them wants to stay out in the modern world and one of them wants to go home. Um, and then the song you just heard is um, one of our Amish characters gets a job in the mall at a, at a photo booth, which is very not okay for the Amish kids to be taking photos. Um, and he befriends Maurice, who is a musician um, and is in a band. And um, they all sort of struggle with the choice of, of uh, whether or not to go home and when they, when they want to grow up, I guess. Yeah. And Maurice, uh, whom Salda mentioned, is the character who sings that song you just heard. And he's a, the word you were looking for, right, <laughs> is English. They refer to oh, okay, uh, yes. people as English, even though we're here in the United States. But it, it goes back <laughs> that way. So there's the English um, and, the, and the Amish. Yeah, now, sorry, what were you saying? And Maurice is an English, an English boy, and he... Uh, sings that to get one of the uh, one of our Amish kids kind of to pull his pull his act together and <laughs> grab life by the horns and drive it drive it like he stole it. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I definitely wish that there was an English boy out there to sing that song to me. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> no, uh, I know if Elisa Bellflower is watching this, she is was probably like hitting her forehead when I was um struggling to find that word because now it's all coming back all of her all of her dramaturgy that she sent us and everything so um lisa if you're out there i am sorry <laughs> but uh what a um the like can you repeat it's rumspringer right how, how do you say that yeah rumspringer okay cool which sounds kind of like naturally ripe for drama actually now that you kind of like explain it it's like it, it almost has this like yeah, like inherent dramatic quality to it with with just like the nature of the event, really. Um, yeah, so that's fascinating concept from the moment that Zelda um, told me about because I didn't know anything about it. And Zelda was watching some documentaries on YouTube about uh, Amish culture and Amish teens, and it just seems like such a such a thing to musicalize and to to really dig into this unbelievable you know, choice that, that these very young people are making and deal and then, you know, questioning or examining technology and the way the world is. I just think there's something really universal about that. And also just culture and tradition, which I think is something that applies to, you know, the person from the small town who's gonna go to the big city and kind of change and maybe get a little further away from the values of, of their family, possibly. And just, there's there's just so much about it that I find to be universal. So it was a fun thing. Yeah. To do. yeah, yeah. And so we might have some viewers who aren't as familiar, but um, our ASCAP Grow a Show workshop is this biennial event at the Lead Center where musical theater writers can workshop a 50 minute portion of a new work for a panel of accomplished artists in the industry. And so um, Selda and Derek, what was it like workshopping modern during Grow a Show? And what were some of the takeaways or changes that you've maybe made since it was at the Lead? 
<laughs> I'm excited for this part. Any new music? <laughs> it was really, uh, it was a, a wonderful experience. We, we, uh, we, it was us and one other writer, Matthew, Matthew uh, Puckett. Um, and we were, you know, in Lincoln, there's only the two of us and this one guy, we kind of got to know each other. The, we had three sort of mentors that sort of, we hung out through the week and, and um, we're just sort of there to be of, of use. And then we got to work with um, all the students that were incredible. Um, and we had just gotten out of a big rewriting phase. Um, let's see, that would have been, I think, in September. I, and we were away in August where we had done a bunch of rewrites, came to Lincoln, um, saw how, how those rewrites were. And then we had the following month, we had the New York ASCAP workshop that we had to do rewrite for that. So it was this sort of amazing thing right in the middle where we got to see what happened with the, the August one. And sort of because of the great feedback we got, um, we did a big overhaul of the opening sort of as, I mean, I think even the mm -hmm. next day, we just did this huge overhaul of the opening and started um, on the airplane on yeah. the way back from Nebraska. We really kind of backed off a whole new version of the opening. But it was great. I loved the, I loved the experience. I loved the, um, we were, I loved the sort of community aspect of it with, uh, Alisa and then Becky and Petra. Uh, it was cool. It was really, really cool week. Yeah, and just the flexibility of the of the students and the actors to be able to roll their sleeves up and and take changes, take changes and make choices and show us. Like we don't come in there, you know, just trying to teach what we have and see it. Just, just you know, verbatim. It's really about um, workshopping it. And, and if we can get that kind of trust. Um, and, you know, I don't know, bravery, courage to just kind of try things out and take changes. I think that's the most exciting part of developing stuff. And we definitely have that. Yeah, that, that's really exciting. I'm definitely excited to see um, what that new opening looks like. I, I, I remember, I thought, I thought that the opening was just like a really fun and energetic number and really got the show driving. I don't want to like keep using driving <laughs> metaphors because I think I recall like that was one thing that somebody like, I don't know if it, that somebody mentioned. So I didn't know if, did you guys change any of the titles to exclude the word drive? No. No. No, I think we didn't. Yeah, because one of the feedback, one of the pieces of feedback we got um, from one of the amazing mentors, I believe it was Michael Corey who said it was just like, chill out on how many times you talk about we get the metaphor that they like because <laughs> yeah. they uh, teenagers are, are obsessed with driving in cars and that's one of the first things they want to do when they get out to the modern world yeah and we definitely drive no we drive that <laughs> in but um we're on the verge of overusing it and i think that we may have just pulled back a couple mentions and lyrics but the song and, and dialogue still, and dialogue and dialogue yeah. So we took that yeah. part and I think it was very smart, but the answer, no, we didn't lose any actual talk about it. And the, the song you're referring to that was the opening, Ryan, is still there. It's more than okay. on some stuff before it. So, oh, so okay. all that material is, is preserved, but we wanted to show them in their Amish community before they get out into the party house. So oh, okay. Knowing what home is for them and what their community is, I think is something that we're really, wrestling with about how much we how much we need to do that yeah because there's economy of time and yeah yeah mm -hmm. well i like just even when i was going back and, and and looking at like the material and and preparing for for today i was just thinking like super meta i mean just like the the the, the driving truly is like when when people like that's is a super relatable thing because you know the, the freedom like for someone who's not like, Amish of course like I remember the f I was thinking about the first time that like I drove with like my learner's permit to school and I was, it was like in the middle of the day and I had the windows rolled down and it was like spring and I was like this is awesome and yeah, yeah so I definitely um do think that that is a very relatable and uh, metaphor so 
I like that a lot. Um, but, you know, uh, speaking of relatability, I think that most people, um, <clears throat> before they like see the show, before they probably like, see some of the marketing and, and get like some of the clips of it, they wouldn't like think like a show about Rum Springer is relatable because it's a fairly niche topic. Um, but I remember, of course, being a part of the reading and just loving the music because, like I said, it really addressed some of the themes that are universal to coming of age. And um, <clears throat> like you kind of mentioned earlier about like making the decision of like, like what to take from your family and as as you grow up like whether to go home and whatnot so since it was so it, it was so seamless i think both from an audience perspective and from a performer's perspective was that purposeful on your guys's part did you have to work to make room springer more accessible to the average audience member or was it as seamless of a transition as it seems like it was I, I would say that from the beginning of, of writing it, we always were using parallels with things like a kid that, that lives in a small town in Texas who decides to come to New York to study mm. and his grandparents and all of his aunts and uncles and all of his cousins live in the same one mile radius. It's a huge shock when he decides to go to New York and they have to deal with that. And then, you know, a, a kid from, from a, a family from overseas who moves to the United States with their own traditions and their own their own um, stories? Who then they move here? The kid wants to become an American and wants to yeah. fit in with his classmates, but his family is saying, "No, you have to stick to these roots. That's who we are." Um, so we've always paralleled that with with sort of all of the choices we make in the show. Well, we did have uh, our work cut out for us just to very efficiently <laughs> and clearly explain the rules yeah. of this yeah. world. Um, what Rum Springer is, it's a, it's a tricky thing. A lot of people, including me, when I first heard about it, just thought it was you have one year and you either decide to be Amish or you don't. And if you don't, then you're out forever. You're out of the church and lose your family and everything. And it's actually a lot more nuanced than that. Mm. There's no set amount of time for it to be out. Um, and you... It's just, there's a lot of gray, gray area, which I think is, can be a, um, you know, an asset, but it takes work to communicate to an audience and there's not a lot of time to get things out and across. Yeah. So, so I think Selda, um, as writing a majority of the book, she did a, a really wonderful job in clarifying what some of those rules are and stuff. And it's different from each community, and there's it's just there's different there's so many different variations of rules. As you would imagine, there there would be. Um, yeah. But once we establish those rules and those parameters, I think that it was really easy to make it relatable, just because, like she said, the scenario is so similar to life, and I think that's what drew us to it in the first place. And is to replace the idea of one year being this timeline, we basically have um, a baby on the way from from the sister. Of mm, yeah, the yeah. So, so it's kind of like if he hasn't chosen to embrace his faith, then he's just not going to be able to be part of that baby's life until he does. And he really wants to be there when the baby first comes. And so that that's how Selda created this kind of timeline. Yeah, yeah. ticking time bomb underneath everything. Well, yeah. And I think I think kind of the idea of like it, or part of what I'm hearing is like re, like responsibility and accountability. Like who are you? Like who do you who are you kind of responsible for and to and and um, so like you know yourself, your family, your community, um, your faith, and kind of how those all intersect. Yeah, and like yeah. how almost like you know, the I feel like, you know, the kids are struggling, definitely. Like, why does it have to be a choice? I mean, that's definitely something that I think that we are, we're all struggling with always with, with intersectionality. And um, so that that is really cool. I was just gonna say that is really interesting way to raise the stakes. Cause I, I would agree, like if there is no timeline, <laughs> like a baby, yes, there you go, <laughs> nine months, that's all you have. <laughs> that was really, uh, really intuitive. Great job on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So thinking about like these themes and backstories, like what was your inspiration or like, how did you come to this, this idea for modern? Selda went down a YouTube rabbit hole 
And <laughs> There's a New York Times podcast about that. <laughs> and she, she came to me and um, I, I have to admit, my first reaction was, you know, is this the most boring idea for a piece of beaver ever? Because it's going to be like, is this just like two Amish kids behind a barn playing with a stick? Like, what is it? <laughs> and then when I got closer to it, it's like this is so electric and so so vibrant, so so powerful. Um, I didn't think much before I had that first reaction. I think I playfully said that the first time, but it's just um, they're so they're so similar to they're just just like they deal with the same things we all deal with. And and since then we've done um, we've taken a lot of uh, you know effort to to get closer to the to some people in the community and, and had mm -hmm. uh, interactions with people who are both still Amish and, and former Amish and had some really great conversations and, and hangs to to learn more and be able to do to do our best to tell the story of it. honestly and, and with knowledge and respect. Respect. Yeah. The um could you speak a little bit about how you like how you handled the musical styles because just from and this just from what I remember and I know I spoke a little bit about it and I hope that I did hit it on the nail when I talked about how that like that rock style was it, it feels different from the rest of the texture I think of the show when they're like in the modern world and then also when they're back home in their community can you talk a little bit about those decisions and how how you went about making them and um kind of where all that that comes from because it's so diverse i felt like musically so it's not, it doesn't feel one shaded at all i think there's two different two different things happening uh in my mind as the music person simultaneously so let me see if i can break this down clearly the first is that when they're in the amish world and the amish community is singing it's um sounds like a very traditional amish sound which is a lot of very simple choral music with very minimal harmonies and, and minimal complexity because it's all about humility and just being humble before God. So nothing too flashy. And that um, carries over into the way that they, they do um, a lot of music. And the accompaniment is just um, often just a harmonica or a piano, very simple. So we, we have to start that tone in the Amish community. Then we have our modern our English characters. There's two main ones. The one who sang the song, Drive It Like You Stole It, and then this other character named B. Mm -hmm. They have a different sound that's just more contemporary. Hers is a little more soulful, and his is whatever that is. He's kind of like a little bit of a just a, a rocker, right? So yeah. you've got this traditional Amish, Amish sound from the community, and then you've got the modern stuff. But then when we're dealing with the Amish teens themselves, mm -hmm. I wanted their sound to be contemporary, but still referencing the kind of folkiness of what they're what where they came from like an earthy grass you know bluegrassy earthy folk sound that's contemporary and there's some wonderful references that threw me in the right direction and things like the lumineers and the david brothers and mumford and yeah. so is a great way into that and then as they get deeper into their souls and their their music is kind of spinning deep within them emotionally that's when a lot more plugged in you know guitars with lots of layers and effects and stuff can come in and it can become very very uh sonically rich so they're they're having this like sliding scale of being kind of um folky bluegrass but then with this big kind of you know stuff like i mean i love the edge from u2 the guitarist from u2 and he's just like a master of creating unbelievable layers with, with guitar sounds are super evocative. And there's a lot of bands since then that have done that. So that's happening for the Amish characters. And then, so there's really like three different um, approaches, the, the traditional community, the English characters, and then a whole bunch of stuff happening inside the modern, it's, I'm sorry, inside the Amish characters. Yeah, well, I, I think it's gonna be like super exciting when people, when uh you know i hope that th soon there will be like some more like that the, the full like soundtrack or i guess like full like 
excerpts from songs on uh, the website because I like I always check because there's songs that I heard when we did it and I'm like oh I want to hear that song again because I, I really love that so I'm looking forward to when that day comes um, but you know I'm sure it is impossible to pick but I have to ask what is each of your favorite parts of the show? Uh, I'm not sure. Hold on, I don't think. I'm sure it's like picking your your favorite child, right? <laughs> I guess. Yeah, my favorite song is "Would You Write It in Ink," which is oh, like yeah. the end of Act Two. So it's really like it's the third to last song in the show. Um, but I think my favorite part is that is is sort of the opening up through our main character or one of our main characters, sort of his "I Want" song that's called "In Between." It's like mm -hmm. he, he makes the switch, like he decides to sort of go in this with, you know, feet first and not, and not, um, what's the right word? And not, not, not just tip his toes, dip his toes and just really go for it. Uh, I would say that opening is my favorite. We also worked so much on it, so I hope it's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I don't, I think it's always, for me, it's the latest thing we're working on. You know, okay. I, I don't, I wish I'd give you a better answer. I have moments where one song is my favorite over another and that kind of changes. And depends on the, you know, the context if we're doing a concert versus, you know, something else. Maybe there's different things that come through in different ways, but we're problem solving and I put myself in a mindset to love, to love it. You know, mm -hmm. I genuinely do love it, but I like really, really, really psych myself up before we go into whatever work session it is, whether it's with an entire cast and the team or whether it's just Selda and me alone um, or me alone at the piano. I just kind of find what I love about it. So it's almost always the latest thing. Okay. You know, uh, you mentioned, uh, would you write it in ink? And this is, I guess, a little spoiling the end because we always have like, video at the very end but since we have you guys here rather than me try to fumble through an explanation of what it is since you guys are there it is your baby um do you think you could give our viewers a little bit of a sneak peek of like what uh, some of the context of that song for when for when they hear it later without i know it's it is later so um without i guess revealing uh too much of the plot yeah this is sung by an amish uh teenager named willis and he is um, interested in photography and makes friends with the guy, the guy who sang the first song that you played, Drive It Like You Stole It, and they become friends. And he's thinking about going out on the road with that guy's band and being their like band photographer and being the country and really um, Me. <laughs> moving away from, from his Amish uh, culture. And he goes out one night with a bunch of like his Amish friends and non-Amish friends and drunkenly he gets a tattoo of the name of that band, which is the Good Citizens. So he gets a tattoo of the Good Citizens and later that night he goes to the kitchen to go get some water and he sees it in the mirror and then he sings that song and the song's called Would You Write It In Ink? And it really examines, um, you know, how certain we are about our choices. And this is the moment that he does actually decide to, to go. And then moments after the song, you see, you know, a silhouette of him with a suitcase walking out the door and, and <sighs> joining the, his friend, Maurice. And so that's, that's a, big, a big moment. And it also is kind of an anthem for the whole show, a theme that they're all, the, the English characters and the Amish characters are all thinking about that question. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, so it's just in listening to y'all talk today, it's so clear that you bring out the best in each other as writers and storytellers. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us a little bit about how you got your start working together? Yeah, we were roommates. We still are roommates. We were roommates um, in another apartment with another uh, friend who works in TV production. He's like an a amazing theater mind and, and singer, but he, he works now in TV production because he's very smart and he knows <laughs> not to pursue writing theater. <laughs> <laughs> he has 
copy. He wanted to make a short musical film. So the three of us, because the three of us would hang out in the apartment and play music and stuff. And so then I worked separately with other people on other projects, especially up until that point. So that's all we did. We didn't write together. And the three of us went away to write this film over the course of a couple weekends away. And it was supposed to just be a hobby, passion, little fun thing. And it slowly picked up some steam and some cool people got involved. And all of a sudden, like, you know, I woke up one day and so then I had a career that we couldn't deny. Like we had paperwork and we had <laughs> things happening. And it was just like, okay. And then that led to some more opportunities. Um, the name of that short film, by the way, is Grind. And it's about a serial killer who's on a, a hookup app. Played by, <laughs> killer is played by Anthony Rapp, who you may know from the original Rent. Yes. But um, yeah. And, this this, is, and it was back when, when dating apps weren't a thing. Like I didn't, when, when our friend suggested this, I didn't even know that it existed, which is not that long ago, how quickly that just became a, a thing. But Yeah. <laughs> it would have been 2016 that we wrote this. And yeah, one thing led to another, and then we started writing, you know, songs, and and then we really modern was the first, the first thing, the first real project that we that we dug into, and since then, when I, I know one of your next questions because I looked at the actual email, but you're gonna <laughs> what else we're working on, and we'll have a good answer for that because we've got um, three other new big projects. Okay. Very good. So, do you do you want to tell us a bit about those? Yeah. Or, well, you're the one with the questions. Whatever. whatever you want. <laughs> well, you're you're just ready to slide through. So I, <laughs> that's, that's that's great. Here, I'm like sitting back at home. I'm like, you know, my Virgo's coming out. I'm like, this is like click 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 bullet points. Here's my list. But yeah, totally. Like, what new projects are you working on? In addition, in addition to modern, right? Because everything is constantly. Yeah. Well, Modern, we were supposed to do in 2020, we had three or four opportunities that got canceled because of, yeah. because of the global. global, which um, obviously that's a bummer, but I think a lot of them are gonna happen this year. Mm -hmm. we had... um, so we started writing two musicals. One of them is a three person musical set in Provincetown. Um, oh. Uh, one and then the other one is a, a big show about a, a gaming team, a professional gaming team, and a, and a 16 year old girl who um, gets recruited sort of um, unexpectedly, um, and it follows her sort of journey through that and and the gaming um, community in general. The gaming show is called Particle, and the Provincetown show is called Off Season. Okay, um, those are two new musicals, and then there's some like. Film. Oh yeah, we just did the songs for a, a feature film that's in festivals and it's going to be coming out sometime later this year. It's called American Reject. Oh. And we did all the original songs for that. And yeah, yeah we're doing a, the, the music with Eric Kropp, who's a wonderful um, pop singer based in Los Angeles, although he's been in Montana for the pandemic. Um, and we're co-writing his EP with them. And yeah, some just like some TV film percolating stuff, nothing, nothing that's totally certain, but we're talking with some really exciting people about cool stuff that keeps us feeling great. We learn a lot when we work in different areas, like you just keep learning because there's different different rules and different processes and it's super cool. Yeah, well, you know, I am looking forward to everything that is coming down the pipeline for you guys. I'm looking forward to modern. I'm looking forward to, um, you know, you guys getting to present your work now in 2021. Fingers crossed, right? <laughs> uh, art coming back, the industry. Well, it's it's been here the entire time, but getting to return a little bit to what we're used to, I think will be um, be very welcome. And I am so excited. Uh, to see everything that you guys have for us. And I just want to say thank you so much and bought my heart yes. for coming back and doing uh, Lunch and Learn with us. I really appreciate talking to you guys. I know it was wonderful um, for you guys to meet Jane and, and everything. Yes. So thank you for giving us that. And we'll all be keeping tabs on you guys. 
Um, and to our viewers, go listen to Modern on Selda and Derek's website. But thank you guys so much I for joining us today. Thing while we oh, have, yes. I want to say one thing. We, we really have to thank and mention Elisa Bellflower because yeah. Elisa Bellflower is, you know, such a such a force in this community and in terms of development and she's got super like strong ties to really cool people in new york city and she just they all know who she is and she's there's always there there's a handful of people that just like really get things done and make these huge opportunities happen and keep writers inspired and she's just like like one of very few that that um that is at that level so no we're very sweet that's true she's, oh that's true she's amazing so yeah. we're really lucky that you know and all all our writers and she's very friends, proud of her students well she loves you guys that's and ha and how lucky are we to have her in lincoln nebraska right yeah it's, it's crazy so, so I mean, we, we really can never let that be understated she's great well yeah. Yes, I completely agree. She is a wonderful woman that we are super happy, like Jane said, to have in yes. Lincoln. Um, and yeah, thank you again, Zelda, Derek. You guys are great. And um, we'll see you soon. Thank All you right. for having us. Thank, right. you. thank you. Bye. What'd you think? Uh, that, was, <laughs> that was great. It was so, I, I really enjoyed getting to learn so much about Rumspringa and just how, yeah, kind of, I mean, a little bit, like I said earlier, but how it's just, it just seems so ripe for this dramatic form. Um, it's, it, it, and such a, such a, in, in, a, in a way to build a complex storyline too. It, it just yeah. seems like it's very layered, um, which is so interesting to me. I wish I would have been here to get to see the ASCAP <laughs> workshop, but yes, you well, know, next time. <laughs> Um, but yeah, now time to close out with you all with a fan favorite segment of Lunch and Learn, what we're watching this week so you can tune in on some of the best content the industry has to offer. Um, and in memoriam of the great Cicely Tyson's passing last Thursday, I am rewatching How to Get Away with Murder on Netflix. Um, I binged the show back at the beginning of COVID, which was literally like a year ago. I was just thinking about it. Um, but yeah, when I heard of Cicely's passing last Thursday, I, I was like crushed. Um, but also honored in a way to have been around to see her perform and to, you know, like watch her speak and and just get to see her impact in her lifetime and give so much to the industry because she's she's just given more than most will ever give in their lifetime. And future audiences really have no idea, I think, what they'll be missing. Um, you know, how to get away with murder is not like the most like major work that she has worked on. Um, she has many, many contributions, but for me, it was like the on-camera relationship with Viola Davis as her daughter. Um, those are gonna forever be some of the most memorable moments of TV for me. So I really liked it. And if you guys want to touch on um, some of her work that she's given, go give her a Google search for some of the other like really incredible movies that she's been a part of and watch how to get away with murder. Yeah, and I, I'm also a huge Cicely Tyson fan and a How to Get Away with Murder fan. Yes. Um, and seeing some of the seeing some of the posts that um, Viola Davis had this week too, you could just like yeah. tell that their connection was so genuine, and you can see it on screen too. So yeah, one hundred percent. I yeah. was always sobbing every month, every mother daughter scene. I was sobbing. <laughs> Yes. Well, so what I'm watching this week is I, I'm super excited about our Lead Center virtual presentation of Ronald K. Brown and Evidence at Dance Company's Grace. And so we're going to have a virtual presentation of that on Friday, February 5th. So this Friday at 730. And um, in order to watch it, it's free. All you have to do is register at leadcenter.org and you get to watch this incredible dance company for free. Um, and something else I'm super excited about, because I've been the person planning it, um, <laughs> is we have a post-show discussion with um, the company founder and artistic director, Ronald K. Brown, and the head of our UNL dance program, Susan Arda. Um, so I had a chance to watch a little sneak peek of this production um, and watch Ronald K. Brown teach a masterclass yesterday to our UNL students. And so um, I think you could trust me when I say this isn't one you want to miss. Yes, and if you did enjoy spending time with us today, which I know you did, because you're back, um, we encourage you to donate to the Lead Center Ovation Campaign to ensure arts and programming like this remain an essential part of the Lincoln community. You can find the donation link on our website, 
And that just about wraps up this episode of Lunch and Learn. So we'll be back with a new episode on Tuesday, March 2nd. So keep an eye on Facebook and be sure to mark your calendars. And we do have actually another Lee Learning Online event this week that we wouldn't normally have this week, but it was postponed due to um, the snowstorm. But we will have Parking Lot Party, a special edition of Huskers in the Spotlight, on Thursday at noon. So also tune in for that because we have just a lot of awesome programming for you um, yes. these next couple weeks. Um, I also want to say a special thank you to Stephen Colonna, who's in the virtual control room, Liv LeBlanc, Kelly Inquist, Lauren Durbin, Ellie Feiss, Quinn Sleddens, and Matthew Boring in marketing, and Sasha Dobson in the education department. This series would not be possible without their support and hard work. And as a final gift for y'all, we have a short clip from of a so short clip of the song from Modern that we talked about earlier. Um, would you write it in ink? So there's just another great example of the beautiful art that's touched the lead center. So go give the entire soundtrack a listen and stay tuned to the stream for the awesome tune. So until next time, lunch and learners. How many times in life can you take something back? When you're looking for gray and all you see is the white and the black. When you go down a fork in the road, do you know if you're on the right track? When the moment arrives and you have to decide what you think. Would you write it in ink? What would you say if you thought that nobody could hear? What would you let yourself feel if the feeling would just disappear? Would you trade a whole life in the dark for one moment that's clear? Is it worth it if it might be over before you can blink? Would you write it in ink? Would you change who you were? Would you hold on to choices you made when the words you were saying were slurred? Would you write We refuse the battles we're willing to fight and what we're willing to lose when the moment arrives and you have to decide what you think. Write it in.